So as you can see, this is a, a joint paper today with Nugu Kiyotaki and Shenqing Zhang, who is a colleague of mine at the LSE. The title is Credit Cycles. Oh, sorry, credit. <laughs> you, you may excuse. Uh, the title is Credit Horizons. And the question that we want to think about is an entrepreneur without a deep pocket needing to raise funds typically turns to the financial markets and offers future revenues. And it's true that the number of years worth of future revenues that the financial market is willing to um, lend against is well, typically between three to four and a half years. Now we interpret that to mean the first three to four and a half years. That is to say the credit horizon is quite short, even though the project, the underlying investment project could be long term. So we would like to explain that and then use the explanation to ask the more macroeconomic question, could it, might it be the case that a drop in long-term real interest rates leads to secular stagnation? And in that, that question is naturally prompted by the experience of initially, I suppose, Japan and then countries in Southern Europe and is becoming more prevalent around the world, that low interest rates don't seem to be delivering high growth. Uh, so here's one slide to give the sense of our approach. As uh, the governor mentioned, human capital is center stage here. Human capital of the entrepreneurs or more generally key workers. I'm thinking of the chief scientists in the research and development department. Um, more generally, I'm going to call them engineers when I reach the model. Their human capital is essential for two things, constructing and then maintaining the production facilities. Now, their wage, I use the word wage. Uh, incidentally, can you see my slides? Yes. You can, so you can see. You can see me and the slides. Oh. We, we cannot see, uh, now we can see. Okay, thank you. I'm particularly keen that you should see the slides. I think seeing me is a, a luxury too far. And, okay, um, so I'm gonna keep going. Please interrupt me if um, you can't see the slides. Now the wage of these key workers, the entrepreneur or engineer, um, reflects their marginal contribution to productivity. And that is a contribution they make over the long horizon. That's the nature of contributing to productivity, that it has an effect not just in the immediate future, but it has a spillover effect into the more distant future. I use the word wage in inverted commas here because this is not to be confused with the wages of um, perhaps more uh, regular workers. Now, the human capital is inalienable, as the government mentioned. Um, we put that right at the heart of it all. That's the one departure from Arudimbra. What that means is that they, the, at the time of investment, an engineer or entrepreneur cannot credibly promise to work for less than that ensuing wage. And what that means is that, and this next step is a little opaque at this point, I, I freely admit, and I hope it'll become clearer when I've done the modeling, that the implication of that is that the fundraising capacity of entrepreneurs is governed largely by their near-term revenues, as I said at the beginning. And now a fall in long-term interest rates means, or may mean, that funds, the fundraising capacity of an entrepreneur at the time of investment, may not expand as much as per investment cost, which has a longer duration. So, uh, paradoxically, her investment may be stifled. Now, normally we think of low interest rates as being a good thing for people who are raising money, but here it's going to turn out to be possibly a bad thing, and then we have the general equity model that turns out stifled growth too. So, here is Smaller economy with very real interest rates are 
There is some people, I don't know what has got that, not that microphone on. Maybe it's me, but that's why I'm not. Okay. The Holy Bean is parish for consumption or investment good, and each of these discrete days. A continuum arrangement for the common good count back there, eta, which is left in the bar. Now, each, I'm sorry, keep asking please, we have your questions. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good, thank you. Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Um, at each day, an engineer, and I'm going to refer to a particular Emma, a engineer called Emma, uh, can jointly produce two things, plant and tools, and her inputs are two things as well, goods and building. So by the, at, the begin, at the beginning of a period of putting in goods, buying a building, uh, the cost of the building is going to be a risk in an edge. It's going to be huge. That's an important piece of meditation. And so at the price of X plus Q, she will produce by the end of the period plant. And I call plant because it's a short time for the equipment inside the building. And then quite distinct from that, she will produce what I call a tool, or in here, a tool that's specific to Emma. Now that's a short time for an augmentation of her human capital, increasing uh, the capacity that she has to work in the future. So there are two outputs. One of them, the tool, is inalienable and cannot be committed or sold, but the other can, and in fact, that's the way Emma raises funds. She sells the plant to a sailor, let's call him Sam. Remember, these um, agents switch roles during the course of their lifetimes, but at the moment, Sam is a sailor and Emma is an engineer. And we want, for modeling reasons, that the match between plant and the engineer is not specific thereafter. So Sam, the plant owner, will be free to hire any Emma for, maintain, for maintaining his um, equipment subsequently, and indeed Emma, our Emma, is free to work for any Sam down the line. The, and it'll be a wage, W. And the essential departure from Arrow de Bra is that Emma cannot commit in advance to way to work for less than me. If she could, then she'd be able to, in effect, to raise more funds and increase the scale of her investment. Now, turning to Sam at each date, he has plant productivity Z. I should have said on the previous slide here, that the starting productivity of any unit of plant at the time that it's first produced, installed, is one. But Sam can choose the evolution of the productivity of, the, of a plant. So start one day where he starts the day with plant with productivity Z, he can hire any number of tools, that is to say, any number of animals, to produce goods, and to maintain plant. So here again, we've got a constant return to the scale uh, production function. The input is a unit of plant with products to be Z. Any number of tools could be zero, H going to be zero, generates output goods. And notice the output is not affected by the input of H. It's just Z and Z that produces the output according to this linear production function with coefficient A. The role of H, the tool, is to maintain or possibly augment the productivity for next periods. Z prime is next period productivity. And that's a combination of today's the function is or Z prime is a function of today's productivity and the number of tools that Sam chooses to employ. Everything, the plant, the tools, even the building, we are certain depreciates by a fact of land at each period. On the subject of buildings, rather oddly, I tend to assume that the buildings are supplied by foreigners. That's just in order to keep the uh, national accounting in the domestic economy clean and simple. They have a use of buildings themselves. One building generates F goods each period, as I said depreciates much like lambda, and the action for that is that the international price of buildings would be Q, as promised, it's F divided by R minus lambda. 
Now, Sam, the plant owner, has an option to stop. So the value of the plant with product of Z measured at the end of the period, it's capital V on the left-hand side, is the discounted value of what? Q, which is the sale price of buildings, or, that's if he shuts down, in other words, or he continues, and then tomorrow he'll earn the revenue, AZ, minus whatever wage bill he cares to go for, choosing H, and then the day after tomorrow's productivity or the end of tomorrow night's evening's productivity will be this little complex production function inside V. So that's Z prime tomorrow's productivity with appropriate depreciation lambda. Now, although this Belden equation, as we call it, is pretty clean to read, it is actually surprisingly, we found, uh, tricky to analyze. And it turns out that the plant owner, Sam, has a clear dichotomy between planning to shut down in the short term, in a finite period, capital T, me, it could be medium term, so capital T is his choice, or to completely differently to continue forever. And those choices would yield different sequences of choices of H on his part. He could, if he's going to shut down in the medium term, then he won't bother to invest quite so much in terms of maintaining productivity, and productivity will um, slowly decline. I mean, in the literature, that's sometimes called the walking death. On the other hand, he could choose to uh, grow, sorry, not to grow, to continue forever, and part of that might be an auxiliary decision. Shall I improve my productivity? Now, the relevance of all this to Emma, remember, the entrepreneur who's trying to raise funds from Sam by selling the plant, is that Sam pays her V of 1. Remember, 1 is the initial productivity of the plant, and B is the amount that Emma can borrow per unit. And that's her, what we call, borrowing capacity. Now, today's talk is just a short one, so I'm going to focus on, as it were, one half of the parameter space, the half in which, in fact, no Sam's choose to shut down. The other half is particularly rich and interesting, but I don't have time to talk about it today. Now, the feature of equilibrium is that no plant owner stops, and because um, we've set things up that everything is in one-to-one -one ratio, H per plant, the number equilibrium statement here, the number of units of plant, sorry, units of tools per plant is one, and given the nature of the product, uh, the little Cobb Douglas function generating Z prime tomorrow, it means that Z stays at one. It starts at one and stays at one forever, and therefore the output per unit of plant is simply A every period. Okay, now this slide is complicated. I won't go into the minutiae, but I do want to give away some of the important intuition. The first equation here is Sam's choice of how many is the, it's what we call the first order condition for Sam's optimal choice of H, which remember in equilibrium will be one in order to clear the market for labor, but um, W in other words is, is an equilibrium number which induces at, um, Sam to choose H equal to one. The right hand side, uh, so that's Sam's marginal cost of labor. The right hand side is the marginal product of labor, which is crucially a forward looking animal. Why? Because any tool of Emma that Sam employs today will en enhance tomorrow's productivity, and that will have an immediate impact on tomorrow's output, but it will also have an implication for, what day is it today, Wait, uh, Monday? It will have an implication for Wednesday's output and Thursday's output and so forth. So the wage, critically, is a function of R, and let me put my cards on the table, as R drops, and that's the thought experiment I'm going to have in mind, that will push the wave up. Now, meantime, B, remember that's what Sam is willing to pay, or V of 1 is what Sam is willing to pay for a unit of plant at the beginning, let's say on Sunday night, is what is left of A after Sam has paid the wages of the employees or the two of the uh, engineers that have been maintaining it. Now, at any point, the productivity is the cumulative contribution of workers who've been employed or tools that have been uh, employed to that rate. 
Now, the word cumulative is crucial because as time goes by and we go from today, Monday to Friday, Saturday, etc., the fraction of the cherry, the cake, that is left for Sam after he's netted out the cumulative wages that he's paid to the various engineers en route Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the size of the cherry that's left for Sam shrinks. In other words, starting from the moment that he buys the plant, Sam anticipates that his residual care of revenues, that is once he's subtracted wages, will be dropping. Um, another way to think about that is this curved line on the horizontal axis, we've got time. This curved line is Sam's share of output, which is of height A over here. It's Sam's share of output going to him after he's net about wages. And that share of output drops. And ultimately, most of the productivity out here towards the high values of T, most of the productivity really can be attributed to the cumulative contribution of, as it were, generations of Emmas that have been maintaining the plant. You might think, look at that, sorry, and one other little thing to, dream, um, to glean from the diagram is F, which is the opportunity cost of the building. Notice that beyond a certain point, Sam appears to be losing money. His share, that downward sloping curve, dips below the opportunity cost. But that's a mirage because at any moment, the wages that have contributed to the output at that time are, for the by and large, sunk. And so the crucial decision that Sam faces as to whether or not to continue is, is his ongoing flow of revenue after wages have been subtracted, which is A minus W, is it bigger than F? If it is, he should continue. So although the, the, red, the red area is there, in truth, Sam does not want to shut down at period 21. He wants to carry on forever in the of the planet space I'm interested in. And then this effect can be strong enough to overcome any rise in net worth to stifle investment and growth. So this rather stylized equation is taken from a sort of generic equation one sees in any macro finance model, where on the left hand side you've got investment, and on the right hand side you've got the savings rate beta, and then this critical ratio on the top line of net worth of the people who are doing the investing, which is that day's worth of Emma's, their net worth, which they plow into investment. The total cost of investment is X plus Q, as I said earlier, they're borrowing B. Now, in the thought experiment I'm interested in, which is suppose that there's a permanent reduction in the real interest rate, that pushes Q up big time because Q is the long run discount of value um, of buildings. What it doesn't do though is to push up B commensurately because B is dictated by these short term revenues that Sam, Sam is anticipating getting his hands on. And therefore, the denominator of this ratio can go up when interest rates fall. In fact, it, because of leverage here, it could go up by quite a bit and more than any possible increase in the net worth. The literature on macrofinance is heavily concentrated on the numerator. Our paper today is one which I guess we could call the denominator. All right, so to close, the upshot is that within my chosen part of the parameter space, there's a subset of it, namely, particularly where Lambda and I are not too far from one, where a reduction in the real interest rate causes growth to go down. And we see that as the parable possibly to describe what's been happening in Japan for the last uh, 30 years on uh, plus, and what's been happening, let's say, in Southern Europe since the advent of the euro. In Southern Europe, when the euro was introduced in the early 2000s, the markets probably correctly anticipated that real interest rates were going to stay low permanently in a new way. Q, the price of buildings, shot up. 
And our thesis today is that B, the borrowing capacity of investors, does not shoot up as much, proportionally speaking. And at the end of it all, this denominator that I'm focusing on goes up and the overall ratio goes down. And in fact, we find that everybody, this is really, I think, quite striking, everybody in the domestic economy is worse off. It's clear that the savers are worse off because the interest rate's gone down. But so too are the engineers. The, um, and remember, people take turns to be one or t'other. The reason why the engineers are worse off is because their leverage rate of return, this issue here, can go, is going to go can go down on account of this more dramatic issue compared to B. So just the last thing to show you is this diagram. Here's a thought experiment where at date five along the horizontal, there's an unexpected fall in the interest rate from two and a half to one and a half percent, which is assumed to persist. So this is a model without any aggregate uncertainty aside from this single shock. Now, the immediate effect is that Q shoots up. And the value of the investment, which of course includes the value of the buildings, really shoots up. Investment itself can actually shoot, go up a little because of the um, net worth effect that uh, Nibu and I put our, our finger on in our uh, 1997 paper on credit cycle. What's, okay, so investment shoots up, consumption goes up for the similar sorts of reasons that there's a, a hike in net worth, which causes people to eat more, so to speak. Output goes up too. So it all looks good. This looks like a boom. But actually, it has within it the seeds of stagnation. The real, the good investment, that is to say the, the, uh, the engine for growth, which is tool and human, the uh, plant, are in a short order shrinking on account of that denominator effect that I told you about. And that persists in the long run, into the long run. So although there's a boom, a temporary boom, in the long run there is stagnation, so output assumes a lower growth path, so does investment, so does consumption ultimately. And in, well, in welfare terms, as I say, everybody can be worse off. So turning back to um, Japan uh, and, East, and, and Southern Europe, at the time it looked like a boom when interest rates fell, but actually, it, with the benefit of hindsight, it looks more like a form of stagnation. Thank okay, you. well, thanks so much, John, for this uh, wonderful talk. and. Uh, you know, once again, we are very privileged to have you and, and the three other laureates uh, today uh, for great talks.